All right, everybody good? Okay, so I think the best way of looking um, at what Imbot's going to be going through, net what? Me? Him. He's making, look, I thought he was making pictures of me. I'm like, what the hell have I done now? All right, so Inbar's going to go through a lot more of the vehicle side of things. So basically, we've had the conversations about breaking them. We've had the conversations about fixing them. Now the conversation is really going to be digging under the hood of these things. In other words, for all of you who are just about to leave here and jump into a car, what, why, aside from the oil and the sticky stuff, is the logical reason for what the hell is going on under these things now and then the future side of it. That'd be a fair enough explanation. And at this point, I'm going to shut up because he really doesn't need any introduction. All right. Uh, so who of you guys is actually in this industry? And who is just, you know, so not, that's nice. That's almost 50%. I'm impressed. So um, what's that? You drive cars. Yeah. So you're a customer, basically. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, why this actually happens. Like Chris said, uh, you've been hearing about uh, cars exploitation and cars attacks, and this is why we're here. But since I believe most people don't actually work in that field, I thought it would be interesting to give uh, other people the good knowledge of why we're seeing this and why it's going to be uh, still around and how we should deal with that. Um, so let's talk about the problem. We use cars to carry the stuff we care about the most, uh, which is our family, right? And we know, obviously, from talks like we've just seen by Caramba, that if our car gets hacked, then bad things can happen. Um, car crashes, you, you always go to the worst case scenario. Imagine electric cars, right? Electric cars, uh, you can blow the car up, right? It's got a big lithium ion cell. If you mess with that, you can blow a car up. So a lot of bad things we're being told can happen if our cars are hacked, but we don't really know why? Why is it like that? Why are cars hackable? Uh, is it going to change anytime soon? And this is what I want to talk about. Let's start with the uh, fact that a car is a very, very complex product. This is a, a partial list. This is not even the entire list. This is a partial list of the external suppliers for uh, this Audi A5. So when you buy a car from, let's say, Audi, because this is a slide I have, you think that Audi makes the car, but Audi does not make the car. Audi is an integrator it makes parts of the car, but large uh, pieces of the car are made by tier one manufacturers. So this is a huge integration project where you get so many devices from so many uh, manufacturers. And while there are standards, each and every one of them is responsible for their own product. And it's not just the A5. These are a bunch of new cars, and the list is huge. You can see about 30 different manufacturers per car. And like I said, this is a partial list. Now, if you look at lines of code, right, we talked about uh, many uh, different manufacturers. It is estimated that between, between 100 and 150 million lines of code are in a car. And mind you, this is more than the space shuttle, right? So this is a huge amount of code being written by a huge number of different um, companies. And this all has to be maintained, integrated, meet standards, and things don't uh, work very well like that. Now. We all know that software has bugs, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have any exploits. It is estimated, and these are numbers that we got from, uh, from talks with the industry, so I don't have any official uh, quote to give you, but it is estimated that when a car rolls out of the factory, after everything has been done, the known number of bugs is about 10,000. Oh, sorry, wrong button. 10,000. Imagine that, a car that you buy has 10,000 documented and known bugs that the, the, the manufacturer or manufacturers said, all right, let's, uh, let's ship it out and deal with that later. Now, the numbers say that the number of unknown bugs, the ones that they haven't even discovered yet, are five times as high. Okay, and these are estimates because you, you don't always know. But 50,000, imagine that number. And this is something that you use every day. Now, uh, they asked, there was a survey. This is a nice survey from uh, three years ago. They asked the automotive industry, people working in the automotive industry, uh, about security. What did they know about security? What did they think about security? And you would be surprised to know what they said. Only 41% said that secure software is a priority for their company. Okay, that's people working in 
automotive industry talking about themselves. And a whopping 72% said they do not believe that the automakers are as knowledgeable about security, secure software development as are the industries. So not only do you have 150 million lines of code, but the people that write it testify to themselves not being knowledgeable about software or secure programming, right? So this cannot end well. Uh, let's talk about the ECUs. ECU used to be engine control unit, now it's electrical or electronic control unit. This is one of the little computers that's in the car. You have many computers, each doing something else. This is a schematic of a car from a decade ago, even more than a decade, 12 years ago. And already in this car, I'll save you the time, I counted, there are almost 60 different ECUs, 60 different computers, each doing something, right? And all, they all have their own code, maybe written by different manufacturers. And this is from 12 years ago. But if you look at a modern car, something that came out in the last couple of years, there are close to 200. 200 different pieces, computers in the car, all talking to each other, right? Now, I'll, I'll admit, some of them are really small. This is the uh, TPMS, Tire Pressure Measurement System. It's that little thing that you know lights the little light on your dashboard when your uh, tire pressure goes down. But even that little thing, this is an IoT device. It's got firmware, it's got code, right? It's running. It has a radio transmitter, and it has a radio receiver. One part is in the wheel, and the other one is somewhere next to the engine. But on the other end of the scale, we have the infotainment systems. These are fully-fledged computers. They're just like your laptop. You can have a multi-core, uh, multi-CPU system running Android with full connectivity. Everything from Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Ethernet sometimes, USB, SD card, anything you want. It's just like a computer, a whole computer, a desktop computer, or maybe your iPad, it's all there, right? So imagine how many uh, problems you could have with that. So we talked about the little uh, computers, but there are also many different types of networks. At home or in the office, you only have one network, right? It's your uh, Ethernet, or maybe you have two of them. One of them is wireless. So let's say these are two different standards. But in the car, you have anywhere from three to six different networks, different standards, separate wiring. Some of them are optical, some of them are coaxial, right? Some of them are low speed, some of them are high speed, some of them are um, low latency, some of them are high latency, okay? And these are all in the same system talking to each other. And some of the ECUs, this little computer I said, some of them are connected to more than one of these networks, right? So this is a complicated thing. Now, the CAN bus, the CAN bus is the main protocol that used to be in all the, it used to be the predominant network in cars. CAN is a, uh, a standard for uh, uh, these little ECUs talking to each other. Now it's slowly being replaced by other stuff, but it's still the main one. And the main thing that it does not have is security. Anybody connected to the CAN bus can pretend to be anybody else and can say whatever they want. Why? Because when it was uh, created, they didn't think about that. Security was not in their mind, okay? Now, you also have, and uh, Tal mentioned that, to make a car takes a very long time, okay? From beginning of design until rollout, it can be something like five to six years, okay? Five to six years. So imagine that there are decisions that you have to, to make in the beginning of the process, like which software are you going to use? And by the time that the car rolls out, that software is already outdated. And you have to meet regulation. And many times regulation is at least one step back behind the market. So you got your software tested to meet regulation, you got approved, but then let's say a bug fix came out. You can't just put the bug fix because now you might not meet regulation. So you ship out a product that took a very long time to make, had to meet, meet a very long list of requirements, and it's quite possible that by the time it rolls out, it's no longer updated. Now, the, the lifetime, on the other hand, is surprisingly high. If you look at your mobile phone, you use them for what? A year, a year and a half before you get a new one? or you did the, the mistake of updating your iOS software and then it runs slow, so you get a new one, right? <laughs> Happens to me every time. Uh, by the way, I update because of security, right? Um, if you get a PC, that'll last, what, five, four or five years, right? 
unless you're a cheap bastard like me, you know, I have mine from, I don't know, six years ago. But it lasts for a while. But a car, you buy a car, now while you may not be the sole owner of it during its lifetime, it'll live for 15 to 20 years, easily. That's what they make them for. So 15 years from now, you're gonna have a product running software from 15 years ago, right? So this, I hope you're starting to, to understand the, the problem here. Now, what do you do when you wanna fix something? You have to take the car to the shop because the ability to remote update is very, very uh, rare. You don't have that almost anywhere. Very few cars are able to update their own software. So you have to go to the shop. Now this thing costs a lot of money, a lot of money. Plus it's a, it's a nuance. You have to lose your car. You have to go to the shop. Now you don't have a car for maybe a few hours, maybe a day, right? By the way, the first uh, cyber related recall, back in 2015, I think it was, cost the manufacturer close to $1 billion, or maybe a little bit more. So just imagine the cost. Okay, yes? Can we not name names? You can name names. Okay. I'm trying to be nice. Now, so a car is a complex product that takes a long time to make, and many, uh, many different uh, uh, individuals or companies are involved in making it. And uh, let's talk about the entry vectors. When we look at a car, everything that connects the car to the outside world, whatever that may be, is an entry vector. Okay, and hackers will try to attack that. But actually, the infotainment itself, you may want a bottle of water or something? Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to use that. Me too, by the way, if you ask yourself. So look at that. Every single one of these things here is an attack vector. It's a way by which the car has some sort of communications with the outside world. And this is where hackers will come. Now, the main problem here is that as the car industry is rushing to connect itself, because this is the big next thing, and we're talking about semi-autonomous cars and autonomous cars and cars that talk to the infrastructure, right? Then they rush to connect the cars, but they're not taking care of the security. And as you probably know, if you've been watching some car hacking talks, which I will mention soon, some of the old problems are not being solved yet, and yet we're introducing new ones. So we're not even, the, 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 the automotive industry is not even dealing with known problems, let alone the unknown ones. So this all is a big thing. Now, you know, it's nice that I say all that. It's me explaining to you why a car is a, is a problem or has a problem. But let's talk about war stories. People have actually proven that, because it's nice to stand here and say why something is not working well. There are plenty of examples. Uh, basically, if you look at the, the media, you will see that no one is immune. Pretty much every big manufacturer was uh, hacked in why we're, uh, one way or another. Could have been something small, something big, at scale, not at scale. But almost no one is immune, uh, as far as we've seen published. Now, academia has been looking at this stuff for a very long time, okay? We have research from as early as 2004, talking about um, security in automotive, automotive bus systems. As early as 2007, there is research talking about connected cars, 2007, okay? So academia has been looking at that for a while. And this is from uh, this year, a nice research by a bunch of people that show that when you have an electric car, running its battery dead is actually a, a good way to attack it and to cause some you know, sometimes it's damaged, sometimes it's uh, just uh, annoying, but it's still a form of attack, right? Uh, of course, the tipping point in the awareness of everybody were uh, Chris and Charlie, right? In 2014, they made the first research public, and then in 2015, uh, they did the second one. The first one was uh, uh, getting code execution and hacking a car uh, by actually touching it. The second one was by doing it remotely, and this completely changed everything that everyone was thinking, mainly because they made it to popular media, right? They made it to Wired. And then all of a sudden, everybody read that the car was being hacked and they saw a Wired reporter driving in a parking lot and she couldn't brake, or it was the other guy, the guy. Uh, he was driving on the highway and he couldn't brake or they killed his car. So it became very real. It was no longer a theoretical discussion of whether a car can be hacked or not. It's not always about, um, you know, code execution and killing cars. These two guys in Romania discovered 
uh, that uh, their car, that the guy that made the USB connection for, you know, you, you want to play some music, you put in a USB drive with MP3 files, but the operating system uh, didn't have the auto run disabled. So you could actually have code execution just by plugging in the USB drive. And when they looked at the system, they discovered that every time that you link your mobile phone with the stereo system, right, to use as a hands-free device, it sucks all the information out of it, all your contacts, all your text messages, everything you do. And it is stored on an unprotected database, and it is left there forever. If you rented the car and you synced your phone with the stereo, and then you gave the car back, all your information is there. So they showed that there's a huge privacy problem, and they actually did a nice demo because they already had code execution on the car. They installed some uh, war driving thing on it. They actually did war driving while driving. It was nice. But the point here was it was a privacy issue, a big privacy issue. And then Tesla came out. And obviously, it's a nice car. It's electric. It's fancy. It's sexy. Everybody knew it was going to attract a lot of attention. And indeed, it got a lot of attention. Uh, this is a very good talk. If you haven't watched it, you should. Uh, these two guys, uh, Mark and Kevin, showed a very nice research uh, how they managed to get car, uh, code execution on the car. I will say two things about that. The first one is they did it by touching it. They literally took it apart and did some hardware hacking, which is nice. And the other reason to watch this talk, if you guys ever do research, they show you about all the stuff that didn't work. It's, it, it looks very nice when us security researchers stand on the stage and we show you how we hack cars. You just saw a nice demo. A uh, guy sitting here and hacking the car. It takes a while to get there. It's, that's, it doesn't always work on the first attempt. So this is a very good talk to learn what doesn't work. And even back then, they were giving Tesla compliments, saying how good it was. But then came the Chinese guys. Two years in a row, they hacked Tesla. And then the second time, they presented a very nice show of remote code execution playing with the doors and the lights of the Tesla. It was the Christmas light show, I think it was called. Very nice. Remote code execution really totally owned the car. But connected cars are not all about the car. People who own them use mobile phones. So another company showed that you can actually attack the mobile phone. Why bother with the car? It's a different it's IoT, it's complicated, many different platforms. But if you have an Android phone, why not attack your phone? And they installed malware on a guy who owned a Tesla. And through hacking his phone, they stole his car. They didn't even bother with the car. They just hacked the phone. So that's another attack vector. And then we have research that got published a few months ago. Same stuff again, pretty much what you saw here. The uh, inf infotainment had wireless inside the car. It had open ports. The people who researched it managed to get code execution. It was a big thing. And then just last month, another research by the same team that hacked Tesla. Once again, the same problems over and over again. Open ports on the network of the car are exposed to passengers or easily accessible by attackers. And we keep seeing the same thing again and again and again. Now, there are rumors of an attack in the wild that was caught and silenced. I don't have any information on that. It's a rumor. I heard it more than once. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. But it's very important because I, I was gonna, I'm, I'm mentioning that. Now, I think only two times I'm going to mention uh, Argus in this talk. This is the first one. In all the times that we were hired to perform penetration testing for customers, we had 100% success. Okay? There wasn't a single time that we failed. And that tells you something not only about our ability, because it's easy for me to stand here and brag, it tells you a lot about the automotive industry. 0% failure. Okay? Now, today, every one of you can buy this little dongle for less than $10 on eBay, and you can connect to your OBD port on your car, and you, start, you can start doing stuff. And it can mess up the car. And there's almost nothing that prevents you from doing that. Okay, almost nothing. So you can just, and any single one of you in this room can hack their car and change stuff. Okay, and while there are standards that allow the car manufacturers to prevent some of these threats, they are either not properly implemented or not implemented at all. So once again, we go back to this is a complex product, many factors, old software, and we keep seeing the same problems again and again, and that's what we deal with. So the big question is, OK, now that we're all depressed and uh, I would tear my hair out if I had any left, 
what can we do about that? So let's look for a second and draw conclusions from the cases that I presented. So it doesn't take a super hacker to do car hacking, right? We've shown that public, published research shows trivial problems recurring. Same stuff again and again. Old and unpatched software, part of it because of the long time it takes to roll a car out, is being uh, released. So you have vulnerable software with vulnerabilities that have already been passed by, 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 sorry, by the manufacturer in other deployed environments, but not in this one, and now the vulnerability and the exploits are published, so anybody can just use them, right? There are many logical vulnerabilities, and this is something I want to I want to concentrate about. Because yes, you can always exploit code. This will never go away. As long as people write code, it will be exploitable. But not all vulnerabilities are about exploitation. If you look at the Chris and Charlie research, the second one, you will see that their biggest breakthrough, or at least the first big breakthrough, was realizing that a lot of the communication between the two different parts of the car that they were researching was done without encryption. And they could actually pretend to be one part talking to the other part. They found a long list of services, and all they had to do was just send messages, throw messages into the bus, pretending to be somebody else, and there was no exploitation there. You were just saying, hi, I am the this device and I would like you to do the other device and that still works if you connect this little dongle I mentioned before you're not exploiting anything you're doing something maybe you're allowed to do it maybe you're not allowed to do it but there's no enforcement and you're not exploiting you're using a service the fact that manufacturers leave open ports this is just bad security if a server is running and it's accessible to the passengers you can just talk to the server you don't always have to uh, you know be aggressive about it so that's also a problem. And not everything requires a, a top-notch research. Because yes, some of it is done by the world's leaders. If you read Chris and Charlie's research, and bear in mind it's from four or three years ago, some of it is really nice. Okay, they actually exploited one CPU to get to the other CPU to get to the CAN bus. Really great work, not everybody can do it, but it's not always that. And in fact, we can safely say that even script kiddies can hack a car today and it's important now let's talk about the cost of operation because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start comparing the automotive world to the one that we're already familiar with the IT security world because we all know security we have a computer we've been using it for a while we've been hacked before uh, so we, we know a little bit about that to find a vulnerability in the IT security world sometimes it's trivial but sometimes the costs go up uh, from simple stuff to sophisticated stuff. And actually, the same thing can be said about the automotive industry. We're not much different there. But to exploit, it's no longer the same. If one good thing happened from the fact that PCs have been exploited for so many years, is that there is an, indeed more security. In one of the security conferences that I attended, I heard the estimation that said that if once you needed between a few hours to uh, maybe a couple of days to find a vulnerability and exploit it, Today, to get, a, to get real good exploitation and remote code execution, you might need a few weeks. You might need a chain of exploits. One to get you good execution, and one to get you out of the hypervisor, and one to give you administrative rights, and one to grant you access over the network. It's no longer that one thing uh, that lets you do everything. So in the cars, however, what we see is you don't need that stuff. Yeah, you can use it, but a lot of damage can still be done using the simple stuff. On the other hand, the return on investment, what do you get when you hack? So if we look at monetization, which is the driving force behind cybercrime, which is the driving force behind the security industry, thank you very much. Um, in the ITSEC world, monetization is solved. There are 20 different ways to make money out of a hacked computer. If you go onto Brian Krebs' website, Krebs on Security, there's a very nice uh, image on the bottom right, uh, uses for a hacked computer. Everything on your computer is worth money either to the guy who stole it or to somebody else who is going to sell it to. Either your credit card information, your personal information, your files. Maybe it's your storage. Maybe it's your bandwidth. Okay? Maybe it's your CPU time mining coins. So there are many things to do with your hacked computer that generate money for the attacker. But with cars, we're not there yet. Now, with the exception of ransomware, because that apparently will work 
on any platform. With the exception of ransomware, we still don't have a good monetization solution for cars. Now, we will change. So that's the thank you for the, the question that always comes up. He said, what about stealing cars? So yes, if you've been following the news, then you know that in the UK, there is a group of uh, criminals that they found a way to steal cars by creating a relay between your key, which is somewhere near the house, and the car. Now, you know how many cars they stole? Four million pounds worth. Now, for you and me, that's a lot of money, but that's not scale. It's not scale. If you could steal 10,000 cars, a million cars, that would be scale, right? Um, so yeah, that's where we stand. Now, scale is a problem. Attacking computers at scale, easy, already solved. There are crime rings that do everything about that. They create the malware, they send the spam, they create the links, the website, the exploit kits. It's a solved problem how to mass send malware and how to attack at scale. But with automotive, it's not the same. It's proven, right? We've seen it done in research, Chris and Charlie, right? They showed uh, their research, if I remember the number correctly, they thought that they had seen, what was it, Chris, like 340,000 cars they thought they saw, yeah, more or less? Crazy. Yeah, so they saw, they saw 340,000 cars that they could attack. Now that is scale, 340,000, that's scale. Well, we haven't seen it in the wild yet. So this is why I wrote proven but not witnessed, okay? And this is our luck. This all stands here on monetization and scale because we're literally looking at the tipping point. Because once cybercrime solves the problem of monetization at scale, cybercrime is going to get into the automotive world. And when they do, they have enormous research, uh, enormous uh, uh, resources, I'm sorry. Cybercrime can be considered a nation state for this matter. And when they get interested in that and they, they start researching it, they will create more attacks, and we will be attacked more. And right now, we're not there yet. Why? First of all, we have too many different types of standards, uh, too many types of connectivity. Okay, so you have to find a solution that is cross-platform, cross-protocol, whatever, and many, many different vendors. Uh, limited monetization potential, but it's all going to change. And one of the things that will change that, connected cars, so they have to follow standards. So all of a sudden, if you find a solution that attacks, that, that successfully attacks the standard, now you can attack at scale because everybody has to comply with the standard. Um, uh, V2X, vehicle to infrastructure. If you attack not the vehicle, but the infrastructure, you now have a watering hole attack for automotive. What if I hack this little device sitting next to the uh, interstate you know, exit? Many cars pass there. If I attack it and they talk to it, it's a watering hole attack. Bless you. Um, one more thing that we're seeing, autonomous vehicles, that's going to be a very nice monetization. If you have a car and it roam, roams free, I can hijack it and I can rent it to other people, right? Car is a bot. And last but not least, there is talk of ECU consolidation. If before we had, like I said, 197 different little computers, today there is a um, the beginning of a vector of combining them, having one computer do three, four, five different things. And the problem with that is that once you get code execution on that computer, you've, got, you've gotten code execution on five ECUs and not just one. And those five ECUs might be sitting on different networks and it's a problem. Now, just a reminder, a modern car, an electric car, has close to 200 different ECUs. This is nothing short of the network of a smaller or medium business. Imagine, imagine any SMB that you work with, your maybe local bank branch, maybe your own company, something, uh, I don't know, uh, the university, okay? I don't know if you know, the univer this university has a class B of routable IP connected to it, right? And all the computers here, they're all accessible from the internet, right? Now, when you have a computer network at that scale of, of a bank, of a store, even of a library, well, maybe not a library, it is unacceptable that you won't have someone doing security there, right? And if it's a bank, you're going to have a CISO, and you're going to have a line of products. You're going to be defending against everything because it's not just, you know, exploitation or just logical 
or just the ECU or just the network. You have to be protecting many, many layers. So this is the same. This car has close to 200 different computers in five different networks. There's no CISO. You as the owner, you have no idea what's going on there, right? Even if something is happening, no one tells you. If you're lucky, the vendor knows, but why, right? Now, here's the thing. The IT security world is dealing with these problems because they're ahead of us, thank God. And many solutions and techniques already uh, exist there. Now, we can't take them as is. This has to be said. Automotive is similar, but it's different, okay? It's not the same thing. You can't just take a firewall, put it in the car and say, problem solved. If you want to take solutions from the IT security world, you have to convert them or rebuild them to be appropriate for vehicles. Because for example, issues like latency, right? One of the reasons you have so, diff so many different networks is some of them have to be very, very quick. For example, the network that connects the crash sensors with the computer that decides to open the airbags, that has to be very, very quick. And it cannot be the same network that your child is using in the back seat with his Android tablet to watch the latest uh, SpongeBob or whatever. Cannot be the same one. You can't have that latency, right? So that's the, uh, the second and only time that I'm going to mention Argus. Uh, we say that this has to be done in a multi-layer thing. It's just, there's no one thing you can do that will solve the problem. If anyone tells you that, it's fake news, okay? I'll be using that uh, term. Um, you have to start by preventing. You have to make the attack itself as hard as possible. And prevention only works part of the time because the attackers usually have the, the initiative or the upper hand. And then you have to understand what happened. And you have to know that you've been attacked. You have to understand what the attack was, what happened. And you have to learn from that in order to be able to use the lessons that you've learned to secure your entire fleet. Okay, you uh, have a hacking going on one car and uh, all the research that you read, that takes months. That can be caught while they're doing the research and before the research is complete, you can already have an update going and preventing the research from even completing. Now we're talking about security by design. This is being said all the time and I agree with that, but there's one thing you need to add here and people don't add it. It has to be done by security people. If you're not a security person and you're being given the job of security by design, it's just not going to be as good. So you have to take people whose business is security. The way they think is security. They have the attacker thinking, the aggressive thinking, the skeptical thinking, the one that doesn't take any assumption for granted because uh, otherwise it's just not, not going to be good. And if you can't do it yourself, don't be ashamed and get it as a service. Get somebody else to do your security if you're a car manufacturer and you're good at making cars, you make the cars, get someone who's good at security to walk with you hand in hand, they will do that for you. I'm not talking about safety, that's a different world. I belong in the security world. If you don't do security well, then your safety is compromised, I agree, but it's beyond my purview, so. Um, now there's a little bit of legislation going on. It's going slowly, it's gonna help stuff. But never wait for legislation, okay? Uh, we have to uh, take the initiative. So summing up, cars are complex products with networks that are as big as those of little businesses and we have to treat them as such, okay? These are networks of computers and they need to be protected and monitored and treated if need be. The tools and the principles are already out there. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel we need to adapt it. We need to rebuild it for automotive. And then it will work. And there's no silver bullet. No matter what you hear, and that's true for pretty much anything, the IT security world, the automotive, uh, medical, there's never a silver bullet. If someone tells you this is going to solve all your problems, move away, OK? Uh, because even, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, even if it did solve all the problems, then the new vulnerability will come up a month later and then it no longer solves all the problems. Uh, you have to have layer defense, you have to detect, you have to report, you have to be able to fix, to monitor. It, if you only do one of them, it's not enough. Detection, not enough. Prevention, not enough. 
And we're the, uh, the security industry of the automotive security industry. We're the people with the finger in the dam. As long as we maintain this gap between the monetization at scale and cybercrime, we're going to keep this advantage. And it's totally up to us to keep that as long as possible. Because once this gap is closed and cybercrime comes uh, into this world, uh, floodgates will open and this is all going to be very, very hard to all of us. And uh, thank you. Do I have any time for questions? Do we even have questions? Yeah, let's uh, do some questions while I get set up. <laughs> okay, uh, very impressive. I'll be at various conferences uh, about autonomous driving. And, and there are two things I'm asking. First of all, the new cars, level three, level. Uh, the, the the new levels uh, two up to three four five whatever whatever there will be will have many sensors on board perhaps 50 sensors perhaps 100 sensors they will uh, create much more da data by definition uh, but my main question is that i understood from all those conferences that the monetization of the whole new autonomous car uh, autonomous driving industry will be in the data Th that's what uh, the big oil nowadays we call it now, if, if the data will be the, the main issue, then this nightmare will explode. So there is a lot of monetization to do on data when it's yours and when it's somebody else's. Uh, the one thing we can say about that is most of it will happen outside the car. And therefore, when we're dealing with the passenger safety, uh, if to answer the guy that asked and left, uh, then it is not the purview of what we are talking here. We're talking about keeping the vehicle safe uh, from hacking and keeping you guys safe. If someone messes with the data and then it is later uh, being used to draw the wrong conclusion, that is a problem, but it's somewhere else. And as a business, you have to pick your battles and you have to choose where you play, in what playing field. You can't do everything. There are a bunch of startups that do just that. Some of them are even presenting today or in this conference, but it is a problem, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. One sec. Uh, you repeated the paradigm that there is no monetization in uh, cybercrime for cars yet. Um, yet you mentioned identity, identity theft, uh, and there's obviously the ability to run armies of bots given any uh, any accessible CPU with an Ethernet, with an internet um, with an internet connection. So maybe we're perhaps that paradigm. Maybe there is monetization in it. We're just not seeing it yet. So I think that in order to run bots on hacked cars, you can do that. But the problem is that it doesn't pay if you don't do it at scale. Because the, it's going to take the resources to do the research, to find out a way to hack a car, to install malware on it. By the way, it's probably doable right now. right? People with electric cars, they connect the cars to their home Wi-Fi. And if that thing is running a vulnerable operating system, piece of cake, even a worm can attack your car. But that's not at scale. The, what's stopping the cybercrime is the combination of being able to monetize and to do it at scale. Because if you can monetize not at scale, or you can attack at scale, but you can't monetize, then it's not a good business uh, investment for the criminal. Speak up. He said any car with an Android system should be hackable, and it's true, but you would have to be able to do it at scale. So you had to find a solution to reach every one of those cars. And Chris and Charlie found them. Okay, they found those cars, and they found a way to it. And that's why I said we've witnessed that in research, but not uh, in the world. Yes. Do you see the future of uh, cars, not necessarily autonomous cars, as being connected to the internet? Because uh, on one hand, that allows vendors to update the security without requiring the customer to drive to the to the vendor. But on the other hand, it adds a new attack uh, vector. So cars will be connected for two different reasons. The first reason is the one you mentioned. Uh, Over-the-air updates are probably the best solution today uh, to uh, deliver security updates to cars. Right? It's something we didn't have before as much, and we do now. But the other reason you're going to have connected cars is because the consumers want that. 
people are getting used to being traveling with their data everywhere. Uh, streaming media, uh, your uh, mobile phone, your uh, Waze, your, uh, I don't know, what, what do you call that thing with the music? Spotify, right? People will want their profile to roam with their, between the cars they have, the setup, and it's all being done over the internet. And these are two different things, and by the way, more often than not, those are, are being done over the same connection, that are not separated, that's one of the problems. combination of uh, monetization and scalability did you consider uh, I mean in Argus the um, combination in res with respect to I don't know large organization large fleets of cars even national security dimension uh, without the pr uh, specific monetization uh, process you know like ransomware but on a larger scale it can be also monetized and create create great damage in that respect you deal with that so Argus's customers are the OEMs the manufacturers so when we uh, work with a manufacturer uh, the intention is to have the entire fleet of the cars or the model be monitored now some of it can go to the vendor itself some of it he might choose to share with others uh, maybe down the road when you buy a fleet of cars and you can have your own sock and not just the OEM but uh, definitely when you work at the OEM level, then you can see things on a global scale and not just uh, one country. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.